And so they faithfully remember them every, every birthday that comes along. And we need a lot of prayers this week for folks. Um, Rick Larrell had a hip replacement on Tuesday and planned to be home on Wednesday, but he's still not home. So um, going a little slow there. And Terry Stecker's still in the hospital. Um, Rosemary Hamlin, who a few of you will know, is in the hospital. And uh, my brother-in-law, John, is in the hospital. Best brother had big heart surgery six weeks ago, and he's back in with, with um, some shortness of breath issues, and something's not quite right there. So we're praying for John. And baby Brinley is uh, still in the NICU, and, and I think doing okay. I didn't get an update this week, but I think doing okay. Wednesday is our final uh, Wednesday together in Lent, service at 11 and 6.30, lunch, and then uh, supper is at 6, and it's been working out real good. It's a quick supper, but just uh, come in, get a bite to eat, and then we'll, we'll clothe ourselves with Christ again this week for, for Lent. Then uh, Holy Week, just looking ahead a little, Monday, Thursday service is at same schedule, 11 and 6.30, Good Friday service is 11, uh, 2 and 6.30, forget the 11, 2 and 6.30. Easter vigil, we're kind of uh, holding off on the time because we're going to see if, if the weather allows us to do it in the evening, starting with a bonfire outside, which is kind of an Easter vigil tradition. And uh, we'll, we'll just play that timing by ear. And then on Easter day... We've got our regular times plus the 6.30 in the morning service, so you can start to think about those. Thank you, Joel and Marcia and Scott and Scott are over there on tech, and if you're joining us from home today, I forgot to say welcome. We're glad you can join us that way, and greetings and peace to you. Let's begin. <laughs>
able. We're using the Blue Book service of communion, page 28, if you want to see music there. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. be with you. And also with you. We pray together. Almighty God, your sovereign purpose brings salvation to birth. Give us faith to be steadfast amid the tumults of this world, trusting that your kingdom comes and your will is done. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Laura's going to come up and read, and I'll give you a little introduction to where we're going this morning. So the gospel reading is uh, a talk about the end of times. Uh, Jesus is serious. The disciples are curious and confused. And this psalm could kind of pick up on some of those themes about you know, earthquakes and everything and turmoil and nation against nation, and God is still God. You might remember this is the psalm that inspired Martin Luther to write, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. Thank you, Laura. The first reading this morning is Psalm 46, which... A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth should change. Though, Though the, the mountains, mountains shake in the heart, heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam. Though the mountains tremble with its tumult. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Come, behold the works of the Lord. See what desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns, he burns the shields, the shields with, with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I am exalted among the nations. I am exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Please rise to receive the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 13th chapter, beginning with the first verse. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. Lord. So we've been in the last week of Jesus' life for several readings now, and this is the final conversation that takes place uh, before Jesus um, in the Garden of Gethsemane, arrest and trial and so forth. As Jesus came out of the temple, one of the disciples said to him, look, teacher, what large stones and what large buildings. Then Jesus asked them, uh, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will this be, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, and they will lead many astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth pangs. But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey. When he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Let's sing for the boys and girls this morning. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Good morning. How are you? What day do we call this day? It's Besides, I know it's snowing. Isn't that crazy? But it's still, it's still marching. St. Patrick's Day. You're wearing something kind of green. You're wearing green. You're wearing green. I forgot to wear green. Oh, Jack, you and I forgot to wear green. You, you forgot to wear green, too. That's okay. Um, St. Patrick, what do you know about St. Patrick? Anything? Anything? What do you know? Oh, well, that's kind of an Irish thing. So, we, so we've got these, uh, oh, Jim back there has a leprechaun tie on. Wave to us, Jim. He said he wanted to be sure that one person was wearing a tie today in church. Thank you. Um, you were going to wear one? I got one on. But So leprechauns are kind of... Uh, a little, little kind of, a, what are they, kind of like fairy creatures in Ireland? 
and they're kind of for good luck, I think. Um, I think. And then you, you see green shamrocks, right? Now that's like a green clover. We would think of it as like a clover in the grass. And uh, they have how many leaves on them? Three. They actually have three. Now the lucky clover would be a four-leaf clover, so we talk a lot about luck. Um, St. Patrick was not, though, about luck. Um, or I don't even know if he's about green, but I, the green is the thing for Ireland because I guess, I've never been to Ireland, but I guess things are pretty green there. Is that right? Anybody been there? Things really green in Ireland most of the time. Um, really beautiful. But here's a little story about St. Patrick. When he was a teenager, he was kidnapped by pirates. Do you know what that means? That somebody took him away from his home took him to Ireland. Pirates took him to Ireland. You could make a movie about this. And he was a, a, like, um, like a slave there, which means that somebody else owned him and he worked for them like probably for nothing. And one day he was able to escape and get back home to England. That must have been a big, big story too. Then, you know what he did when he was a grown-up? He went back to Ireland. He went back to where he'd been taken as a slave. And why is the big question? He went back to teach people about the love of Jesus. So that's why St. Patrick is known as Ireland's favorite saint, because he's the one that really taught them, showed them the love of Jesus. And one thing we can remember from St. Patrick is like if, it, do this with me, okay, everybody do this with me. Remember, we're marked with the cross of Christ in baptism, so start at your forehead, and, and we'll go down to like our, our chest or our belly button, okay? We remember Christ before me, Christ beside me, go from left shoulder to right shoulder, and then back to like your heart, your sternum. Christ within me. That's, that's like Jesus, Jesus in front of me, Jesus beside me, Jesus within me. That's something St. Patrick taught people to remember how close Jesus is. Now I wanna do something with you. I don't, I don't have green shamrocks here, but could I have your, would you mind, can I put a sticker on your wrist? Is that okay? On your hand? Okay, oh, see if I can do this here. Can I put one on you? Okay. Can I put one on you? Okay. Jack, can I put one on, can I put one on your hand? Okay. Can I put one on you, Dominic? Okay. Well, we'll get there. Okay. One at a time here. Okay. So we're going to make, I'm going to make a little shamrock of hearts on you, Okay. And we're going to remember one heart is for the love that sent Jesus into the world, like what would be one of our favorite Bible verses, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son so that anyone who believes in him might have eternal life. And then we're going to remember the love that Jesus showed people And that love, it's like when we were singing that first song today about all are welcome, that's one thing Jesus taught us, that all are welcome. I gotta turn this around a little bit. All are welcome in God's family and in God's house. And then the third little heart guy here can help us remember that the Holy Spirit gives us strength to love other people. So I made a little, it's kind of like a shape of a shamrock, sort of, on your wrist. We made a shamrock out of hearts today. So you remember the love of God, how Jesus teaches us to love, and how the Holy Spirit helps us love everybody, okay? So remember that about St. Patrick. Very interesting life. You could read something about him, ask mom and dad to find it on the computer for you. Or you could probably, there's probably a little video, I didn't even look, probably a little video about St. Patrick's life. And so it's, it's much more than leprechauns and shamrocks, but he used the shamrock, the three, the three leaves, to tell about the love of God, the love of Jesus, and the love of the Holy Spirit. 
Okay. Very good. How about your noisy offerings? Throw them in. Everybody got, you need one? You got it? Okay, thank you. We got lots of, lots of pennies last week. We had lots of shiny ones. All right. And you, you can put the candles out today, okay? Grace to you and peace from God who holds the present and holds the future and holds us. Amen. The narrative lectionary brings us to the 13th chapter of Mark. It's the final week of Jesus' life on earth, and he has some things to teach his disciples yet. We start with prayer. Jesus, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Help us cling only to you every day as our guide, as our strength, and as our reason for being. Amen. So when you get to be my age, you get to reminisce a little bit and, and go back. You got decades to go back on. So um, some of you will remember this song. It is kind of a fun song. Um, back in 1987, the year my daughter was born, the alternative rock group REM did a song called It's the End of the World as We Know It. That was the refrain. It's the end of the world as we know it. And the verses, like if you go look up the lyrics of this song, it's one of those fast-paced, you know, high-energy songs that you can barely hear all the words, so you kind of have to look at the lyrics to figure it out. But the refrain is easy enough. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world as we know it. What's the last line? And I feel fine. <laughs> it's like, okay. <laughs> kind of maybe they were having fun with this uh, thought about the end of the world um, as they know it. And uh, keep in mind that when they produced that song, Y2K hadn't really taken root yet. Now, young people, you probably don't know what Y2K is, but it stood for year 2000 because people were worried about the century changing from 1999 to the year 2000. And Techie people got us worried because, you know, all those wonderful computers that were like invented in the, in the 80s especially, um, they only had two-digit di uh, two date codes for the year because, you know, everything on a computer has to be timed. And so uh, the date codes were like 87, 88, 89, 90 and not 1998, 1999. They were worried that when 1999 became the year 2000, the computers would crash, and your bank accounts would crash, and, and the airline, airlines would, airplanes would crash, and all kinds of things, and there were people worrying about survival with uh, the year changing to 2000. Then there was this other fascination going on before the turn of the century, and it was about this ancient Mayan calendar, which is fascinating, and it's got to do with, with the sun and the planets, I think, and, and everything else that Mayans, that Mayan culture in Central America had made this, what, hundreds of years ago, maybe thou a couple thousand years ago, and the Mayan calendar was supposed to run out like in 25 years, so that would, that would have brought us to maybe 2012. So there are people thinking about that. And then, when that song was written, 9-11 hadn't happened, thank goodness, but 9-11 felt like the end of the world as we know it and changed many things. Um, in 1987, the Packers hadn't won a Super Bowl in a long time, really, and uh, the Berlin Wall was still intact. But that, that rock group was thinking about the end of the world. Well always the world is changing, always in every generation people have been fascinated with the end of time and when's it going to come and what's it like. And this was true in the time of Jesus and Jesus speaks about it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We're used to hearing this brief story at the end of the church year when things are kind of coming to a conclusion like around the last Sunday of November and we're heading towards Christ the King Sunday or at the beginning of the Advent season when we're 
looking forward to celebrating the birth of Jesus, but when we are praying for his coming again. So that's when we usually hear this reading, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, this story takes place in the last days of Jesus' earthly life. And so this is the time for us to do that. And since he talked openly about his suffering and death and resurrection with the disciples on several occasions, it really shouldn't surprise them too much that he's talking about this kind of stuff again, but it had to be a painfully awkward and scary time of, of waiting and wondering what's, what's going to happen, what's going on. Um, it's, this is called the mini-apocalypse in Mark's gospel. I hope you'll spend a few minutes on the, the back of your bulletin reading about apocalyptic writing in the Bible. It has a way of, of uh, stirring up our imaginations, but it also has a way of kind of throwing us for a loop because it's hard to understand. Uh, Daniel and Revelation are largely this kind of literature in the Bible that we call apocalyptic. It's very vivid, uh, highly symbolic, language, message for troubling times. And many students and preachers of the Bible have made a book like Revelation, made it their focus, and like, oh man, if we can just unlock this uh, code that's got to be embedded here somewhere, we can learn about what God's plans are for the end of time and when that's going to happen and, and who's going to be included and, and so, so on and so forth. And I think that is time poorly spent. It'd be much better spent to the, spending that time and, and creativity making the next Star Wars movie or making one more Indiana Jones movie than to try to, to pretend this is how you interpret the whole story of Scripture. So if you didn't catch it, I'm not a huge fan of the apocalyptic sections of the Gospels and of the Bible because they are confusing and they can be used to scare people and they often lead to more questions than answers. But since Jesus is speaking to disciples and to us in Mark 13, his words and warnings deserve our attention. So rather than speculate, uh, let's, um, let's try to read this based on what we know was going on in Jesus' week and what we know is going on in our lives. Um, here's what I'm thinking about. The, the last piece of that reading talked about, and, and I'm sorry, you don't have it in front of you, but the last piece of the reading said, be alert, you don't know when the householder's coming, at evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn. Think about those timings in the Holy Week story. Evening, what do the disciples do on that Thursday evening with Jesus? Last Supper. Midnight, where are they? Garden of Gethsemane, and Jesus is arrested. Cock crow, early in the morning. Who's, who's in trouble besides Jesus? Peter, who has now denied Jesus three times before the cock crows. Dawn, a couple days later. Easter dawn. Just think about that. Is Mark alluding to those that, that sense of timing in Holy Week and Easter, maybe. Um, going back uh, 55 years now in our history, it was July of 1969. Uh, a few of us were around back then. And uh, in July 20th of 1969, remember what happened? Astronauts landed on the moon for the first time. And what did President Nixon so... so uh, triumphantly uh, trumpet, he said, this is the most important week since the beginning of humankind. To which the wise Reverend Billy Graham uh, politely uh, and, and, and rightly corrected President Nixon and said, no, the death and resurrection of Jesus is the most important week, the most important events since history began. Um, think about those 12 disciples who are going to try to stay with Jesus. They've been told something's going to happen. He's going to get arrested. He's going to suffer. He's going to die. He's going to rise. They are about to have the, 
the end of the world as they know it come to them. The, the structures that support the Jewish faith are going to get knocked out from under them. That temple is going to be destroyed about the time that Mark's writing this down, and Mark's audience knows all about that. And that meant that not just for the disciples, but for the Jewish religion, things got to go in a whole different direction. How do you worship God if you don't have a temple? How do you, what kind of sacrifices do you make to God if you can't go to the temple and make a sacrifice? Where do we look for direction now? And I, it makes me think that Mark 13 was far more about Jesus talking to those disciples about their present day experiences than about Jesus making some declaration about a distant future time. Do not be led astray, he says. Remember how disciple Judas was really going to be led astray real soon and how Peter would fall away and the rest of them would fall away? Uh, they were all vulnerable. And Jesus says, do not be alarmed, which is not the same as saying, you know, be calm and just, just don't worry about it, but do not be alarmed. But there's this definite sense based on what he has spoken before that, that all these things are going to take place, uh, need to take place for reasons that are bigger than us to understand. And then think about some of those scary signs that Jesus mentions, uh, earthquakes. Anybody ever been in an earthquake? Um, not too fun. Uh, exciting, but not, not too fun, I don't think. Um, there's an earthquake when Jesus dies on the cross, according to the Gospel of Matthew. And what does it do? It rips the curtain in the temple in two. That's the curtain that blocked off the holy seat of God's presence from the people because people could not approach the holiness of God and expect to live. So there's an earthquake in the story. And the sun refuses to shine. We got an we eclipse coming up in a few weeks in North America. Uh, but those two natural phenomenons are reported that when Jesus dies, this happens. And the disciples are, remember, they're, they're sitting here uh, marveling how amazing the temple was, like a couple of tourists, and then that's going to get torn down. And then there's this call to be alert and stay awake. Think of how on the night Jesus goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He takes Peter and James and John with him to pray. And he pleads with them to do what? To, to pray with him? Well, to stay awake. And three times he comes and finds them sleeping. They just cannot humanly stay awake. And Jesus quotes this well-known verse from the book of Daniel chapter 7 about how you will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with great power and glory, an image his disciples would know. Any good Jew would know that image from Daniel. And that could be an exciting or a scary image or both. And yet in this strange and powerful way, the Jesus we see on the cross is showing his power and his glory. Uh, John's gospel makes that very clear that Jesus is ruling from the cross, that he is judging all the powers of the earth, that he is that all the human sin and evil and suffering and death you can imagine meet their match on the cross, that the cross is where power is and where glory is. Now, I've got to be honest enough to say, I'm not sure that's exactly what we're supposed to get out of this chapter of Mark's gospel, but I'm making an educated guess that Jesus and Mark were more interested in what's going on in life now and in the world here and now than in the world some unknown time in the future. And that how we respond to what's going on here and now is what really matters. So the reality is, yeah, there is an end of the world coming for, for us, for each of us, end of the world as we know it. I'm not a fatalist. I'm not obsessed with dying. I do get to be with quite a few people who have to face death and are dying. And that, that leaves me only a little bit of denial about my own mortality at the present moment. 
But the truth is, our days are numbered. Yours are, yours are, mine are. The other truth is, life is a gift. And the fact that our days are numbered means that no amount of planning or praying or believing can guarantee the future for us. It is just not predictable. Any one of us could be here today and not be around tomorrow. There's just no solution for that uncertainty. But maybe in the words of Jesus, there is an appropriate way to live, to be watchful and ready and keep awake, he says. And it's not real hard to figure out how such things might apply to, our, to the life we have today. Each day is a gift, is it not? And because, of, uh, be, because most of us get to live quite a few years, you know, the days, the days can seem like, oh, we got a lot of them. Uh, the hours can sometimes seem like, oh, we got a lot of them. Um, we, the, the way we spend each hour or each single day, um, it doesn't always seem to matter so much. And yet, we are to receive each day as a gift that the Lord has, has made for us. It's our duty and delight to rejoice and be glad in each day so far as is possible. We're to honor God in the hours of each day, in the work we do, in the commitments we make, the choices we make, the things we do with our time and, and talents and money and opportunities and uh, the power that God has given us. And so that calls us to be watchful and to be ready, watchful for opportunities to serve our fellow human beings. Jesus made a point in, in his last conversations in Matthew's gospel about, you know, when I was hungry, you gave me something to eat, and when I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink, and when I was naked, you clothed me. And he says, as you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. In some fashion, each and every day presents us with an opportunity to serve others. We're to be watchful and ready for opportunities to share the faith we've been given. It may be to encourage someone or to comfort someone or to teach someone or to show mercy to someone or to love someone. Uh, it may be to spread the good news like St. Patrick did. And each day can give us the chance to stand up to a bully or to talk to a stranger or to seek justice for those who justice has been denied, or to speak truth to power. If the death and resurrection of Jesus have been the most, are and, and have been the, the most significant events in human history, as the Christian faith insists that it has, then each day is a day to be watchful and ready. And Jesus adds, not alarmed, but hopeful. And remember, it is in the everyday circumstances of our lives when God comes to us and blesses us and uses us and calls us to be faithful. That is a prescription for a daily life of faith. Thanks be to God. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. And then Pastor Carolyn Winfrey Gillette has wit written, I think, a, a wonderful hymn on this story, so join in when you can.
Our response to the word from Pastor John Vandelar reminds us that we have choices and choices to make. We choose not to give in to fear, even, even when, when we, we are, are threatened, threatened by, by violence, violence and abuse. abuse. We, we choose, choose to believe in the power of love. We choose not to be led by despair, even when dreams fail and the world seems to grow colder and more broken. We choose to believe in the power of hope. We choose not to be blinded by cynicism, even when joy and celebration feel naive and frivolous. We choose to believe in the power of faith. We choose not to be overawed by death, even when grief shuts out all other voices. We choose to believe in the power of life. In every time, in every place, with all people, may your resurrection rise up within us and lead us to new creative healing choices. Amen. As God's people called to love one another, let us pray for the church and the world and for all people according to their needs. God, of all our beginnings and endings, there are times we would long for Christ to return and make all things new, and there are times when we're so caught up in the current order of things that it's hard for us to, to even ask for your kingdom to fully come. Teach us to live expectantly, hopefully, and faithfully in the here and now, doing the work you give us to do, and trusting that you are also at work leading us into a future that is beyond our comprehension. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of new beginnings, we pray for those who are desperate to start over, for refugees and migrants seeking safety and opportunities for themselves and their families, for communities rebuilding from years of distrust or neglect, for those seeking a life beyond abuse or addiction, for those moving on from high school or college, for those growing into discipleship in a way that transforms their lives. Bless those persons and communities and churches and nations who are seeking new beginnings. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Christ, our healer, your mercy endures forever. Draw even closer to those who are sick or suffering or providing care today that they may know your presence and your healing and your promises. We remember before you Rose, Terry, Bill, baby Brindley, Tom, Ed, Dan, Eileen, Roseanne, Mary, Mary Lynn, Gary, Dave, Gerald, John, Rick, Anna, Brian, and those we name before you now. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. God of hope, we confess that we are frightened by so many things. We do not like birth pangs of change, and yet we confess the world is not as it should be. Justice is often put off because changing the ways things are structured is hard. Youth are often discounted. Racial tension is ignored. The patterns of overwork are lauded. And certain groups in perpetual need are accepted as completely normal. It's difficult to be the church sometimes, Lord. It is hard to sound the call on what needs to change. But give us the courage and conviction to work towards that new future, especially when it seems beyond reach. For we do not know when your kingdom will come, but we do know that it's already on the way. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus, who is our hope. Amen. Amen. Please stand as you're able. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let's look around and share a, a word of peace, a sign of peace with each other. Fist bumps are good. Still flu season and COVID season out there. Peace to you at home.
And we're leaving our offerings at the door. And Sean, if you could bring up, or, or uh, Jamie, if you could bring up offering plate, that'd be great. And here's our offering prayer. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts. With them, we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made. For the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Sorry. Come the gifts of God for the people of God and tell me if you prefer gluten free and tell the assistants if you prefer grape juice.
the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ will strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Join in the sending song. I'm going to invite you to stay four minutes and watch a video that was on the news last Sunday night. It's about a granddaughter of St. John's who's often worshipped with us as a young kid. We haven't seen her in a couple years, and you'll see why she's so busy. But this is Aubrey, who's the granddaughter of Donna Daly, okay? Change the trajectory of your life. For one sixth grader, an opportunity to lend a helping hand taught her there's a lot she can do to help others flourish. Stephanie Rodriguez shares Aubrey's power of kindness. It's kind of helped me like keep going, knowing that the people that I help are very appreciative. Aubrey Zell found her calling a lot earlier than most. At six years old, when she witnessed a man experiencing homelessness being mistreated inside a restaurant. I just saw that he was over there and something clicked in my head and I was like, oh, let's get him something to eat. Since that moment, Aubrey has been dedicated to helping others. It feels really nice that I'm able to give them what they need. With her mother, Melissa, by her side, Aubrey volunteers and gives back whenever she can. If she notices somebody on a street corner that needs a meal, we stop, we get something. Um, we put blessing bags in our cars and things like that with basic necessities that we take for granted. She's very unique right, um, very philanthropic, right, um, there's something that she can do for somebody else, she does it. Together, the family started a nonprofit, Harmony's Heart of Wisconsin. If she could give the world a hug and make all of the bad things go away, she would. Aubrey is its namesake. Harmony is my road name because my parents ride motorcycles. And the nickname is fitting because she wants to see her community live amicably. Her compassion is beyond belief, right? You don't expect it from a 12-year-old. Most kids, right, they worry about themselves. They worry about, hey, the next iPhone or whatnot. Aubrey's more worried about, hey, the guy on the street that needs a meal. So um, she's, a, she's a special, special girl. 
One way Aubrey gives back is through food, but she quickly realized that one important part of a healthy diet was scarce at local food pantries. They didn't always have enough fresh produce um, to give out to everybody because they have over 200 people per time they, they open. That's when she decided to give her green thumb a try. So that following summer, she said, hey, mommy, can we plant a garden? And I just want to give it away. That one plot the following year was three plots. The following year was four plots. And last year, it was six plots. She started planting in community gardens. Cauliflowers, peppers, tomatoes, herbs, onions, cucumbers, and squash. But knew she could do even more. I've always wanted my own since we started the garden the community gardens because we've always used other people's so we can't have it all year round now she can this empty plot near 58th and chambers will soon be harmony's harvest i finally get to have my own garden and it is a ginormous space this blank canvas is officially hers and she's ready to give it the harmony flair it deserves and there's going to be a bunch of raised beds and there's going to be a little library Equipped with 20 garden beds, a greenhouse for year-round growing, and a community healing space, they plan to be up and running by Memorial Day weekend. Uh, somebody sent us seeds. To pay for expenses, they're applying for a grant. So your garlic will come back year after year after year after year. However, donations are needed to help Aubrey provide fresh produce to food pantries every weekend. This one talks about what can be planted in winter, fall, summer, and spring. This is just the beginning for the 12-year-old whose love for feeding others with her own two hands will continue to grow. My passion is gardening. It feels, it feels different because I haven't met a kid my age whose passion was gardening <laughs> because it's, such a, it's, just, it's kind of a unique passion to have. Um, but I think, I, think I, I love my passion because I love gardening. <laughs> and I try to... How's that for a young lady who's got a heart, got vision, got mom behind her? Um, that's just amazing. She's been, as she has been doing this since she was six. She's had her own website since she was eight. And um, I feel like, oh my gosh, I wish I'd done that much with my life <laughs> in all my years. <laughs> But um, she's, she's challenging, she's, she's excited, she's uh, uh, inspiration. So uh, we'll see if we have any chance to help her out this year, or you can certainly go to that Harmony's Heart website and help her out and support her that way. So just wanted you to know that that's one of our grandkids from the church. Go in peace and in faith and hope and love. Thanks be to God.